It's so good to see you all. Many thanks for your kind invitation to participate in this Bible conference. And I also want to say many thanks to so many of you who expressed your condolences at the death of my father last month. I want you to know this, that I paid attention and I appreciate and my wife very much this. So here we are at 2022 Bible conference looking at the challenges, the issues and the contemporary and future opportunities as Adventism faces the challenges of 21st century. As you know, whenever Adventism encountered conditions similar to the 19th century East Coast America's birthplace, it did really well. And wherever the society moved on and the conditions have changed, Adventism struggled big time. However, we are not the only religious movement that struggles with its own self-identity. And so, Lorenzo led for us the text from Matthew 23. So if you switch on your holy devices or look at the screen, because you will remember more if you involve your sight and see the Bible text for yourself. In Matthew 23, Jesus applies his sharp diagnostic insight into Second Temple Judaism of the first century. We are going to read verses 29 to 31. It's the last of the seven woes that Jesus says. And while we need to understand the original context, it would be a mistake to read it as a moral denunciation of others. And so we want to and need to apply it to us as individuals and to us as a movement. So, Matthew 23, verses 29 to 31. Woe to you, teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you hypocrites! You build tombs of the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. Which is just another way of saying prophets. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So, you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who, mur who murdered those prophets. Now, if you are like me, and you read a text like this, you must be thinking, what is Jesus talking about? What is this? You notice the phrase, you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous, and then you say... If we lived in those days, we would be different. We would not have taken part in shedding innocent blood. We would treat those prophets differently. So obviously, the prophets are the central idea in understanding this text. So the number one question that we need to understand is, when Jesus speaks about these prophets, what is he referring to? And I want to shed a light on... Uh, give you some examples of prophetic ministry. And secondly, we will look at what did the ancestors do to them? How did the people respond to the ministry of prophets in their days, in those days? And then thirdly, we will look at why is Jesus using this to address the contemporary religious generation? And then the last, number 13 step or something like that, we look at what does it mean for us as we face the challenges, the issues, and the opportunities in the 21st century. Now, there are different ways how you can uh, categorize the prophets. As Julian reminded us, there are some prophets who are non-writing prophets. Jesus says John the Baptist was the greatest of the prophets. He never wrote anything. And there are writing prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah. Then there are prophets that can be categorized as pre-exilic, exilic, and post-exilic prophets. Of course, you have canonical prophets whose writing has been preserved to us, and there are non-canonical prophets who had their important ministry and say for the people of God in their time, but their writings are not part of God's 
inspired word for all places in all times. And we are just going because of time. I can give you only one example. And so I am going to choose one example, and that is uh, Prophet Jeremiah. So in chapter 20, verse 9, notice this is what Jeremiah says. But if I say I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot hold it in. So, prophets are God's messengers. They have a message from God to give to his people. They are God's spokesperson, Nabi or Roe, God's seer. They see the reality that most people miss. And this is an ex excellent example where Jeremiah says, this message that I have received from God, this mission that I am entrusted, it's like a fire in my bones. And if I don't deliver it, it's making me uncomfortable. I can't do it. You see, prophets are a group of people who don't understand complacency. Prophets cannot comprehend how someone can be just going through the motions of religion. Prophets cannot imagine that someone would not consider a relationship with God as the central thing of their life. They cannot imagine that someone would not live with great passion, with a devotion to the living God. That someone would just come to the temple and go through the religious rituals and they leave and nothing has changed. You need to understand that prophets do not go usually to the pagan, quote-unquote, heathen people who don't believe in God of Israel. There are a couple of exceptions like Jonah or Micah or Nahum. But otherwise, usually the prophets are the prophets to people who claim to belong to God. And they are saying to them, what are you doing? What are you thinking? Prophets are those who don't understand mediocrity, complacency and stale religion. They want some passion, devotion. And what kind of things they are referring to? In chapter 7, if you just go back a few chap uh, chapters in Jeremiah, in chapter 7 it says, This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand at the gate of the Lord's house and there proclaim this message. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah, who come through these gates to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Reform your ways and your actions, and I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. I need the slide. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place, in the land I gave your ancestors to ever, forever, and ever. So God says, even the promised land is promised to you on the conditions that you remember why I brought you out of Egypt. The primary task of the prophet is to bring a reform of life. The prophet goes to people of God and says, reform your ways. That was the verb there. Do not think that the temple or the religious services are some kind of a pass if you do not do the right thing. Do not think that your songs, your religious rites, your festivals mean that you will get away with doing the wrong thing. You cannot come and say, oh, but we came to the temple of the Lord. This is the place where he promised his promise, uh, he promised his presence. You cannot say, oh, but we keep the Sabbath. Oh, we pay the tithe. We do not eat the pork. We are vegetarians. You can't use that. It's not going to get you off the hook from doing the right thing. 
prophet goes to God's people and says, you are not acting like God's people. Sometimes the word reform is translated or another word is used, like for example, in Jeremiah 8, God says to them, this is what the Lord says. Can I get the slide, please? When the people fall down, do they not get up? When someone turns away, do they not return? Why then have these people turned away? Why does Jerusalem always turn away? They cling to deceit. They refuse to return. So the word reform here is replaced with turn and return. And the pre uh, prophets sometimes use clever words. They use metaphors, images, sometimes very funny. Sometimes they can get sarcastic. Listen to verse 7 in chapter 8. Even the stork in the sky knows her appointed seasons. And the dove, the swift, and the thrush observe the time of their migration. But my people do not know the requirements of the Lord. Basically, the prophet Jeremiah is comparing God's people to a stork and saying, even the stork gets it, and you don't. And the dove, and the swift, and the thrush, they observe their times of migration, but my people do not know the requirements of the Lord, what God is expected from them. So the prophets come to the people of God and say, it's not enough to put on a religious show. Even the stork gets it. The stork is smarter than you. How come you don't get it? Now, prophets can sometimes be very calm and loving. Sometimes they can use poetry. Sometimes they are going to use diatribes, even rants. Sometimes prophets are doing acted parables. Strange thing like lying on their side or cook their food with questionable material which we are not going to mention in the divine service. Or they are asked to walk in their underwear. Now, if you think you've got a boring job, consider being a prophet. Ezekiel comes home and the wife says, how was your day at the office? He says, for the next year I'm supposed to lie on my left side. Prophets come up with endless ways in which they are trying to get people's attention in order to reform their lives and to convince them to return to God. Let's go to Jeremiah 22. And this is what the prophet says to the king. Woe to him who builds his palace by unrighteousness, his upper rooms by injustice, making his own people work for nothing, not paying them for their labor. He says, the king says, I will build myself a great palace with spacious upper rooms. And so he makes large windows in it and panels it with cedar and decorates it in red. Can you believe that at one point God's people were so decadent that they used their houses, their cars as their status symbol? You would not believe this. The second task of the prophet is not only to recall people to reform and to return to God, but is to speak the truth to the most powerful people in the land. Prophets are not intimidated by whoever had the held, office, held the office. So here is Jeremiah talking to the king, and he says, do you think this is the right thing for you to build your palace to think that if you have spacious upper rooms, if you use the best material, if you decorate it nicely, that this gives authority to your office? Now remember, king has the chariots, horses, bows and arrows and swords and spears and dungeons and maximum, maximum security prisons. But Jeremiah comes into his presence and says, you build your palaces on the black back of slaves. You are a king of a nation that God brought out of slavery. And now you build your future on the back of slaves? Don't you see the contradiction? What happened to my people in just a few generations? 
The prophets don't understand complacency. They don't understand mediocrity. They see the contradictions that people miss. Going through the motions is not going to cut it before God. And so they come and tell the word even to the most powerful people. Unintimidated by the trappings of the office. They can say, you are using your power incorrectly. You are using your power just to shore up your own wealth. And you don't care about the others and that's not right. Notice uh, what he says in verse 15. In verse 15, Jeremiah says, Does it make you a king to have more and more cedar? Cedar was the best, nicest wood that you could use to build your palace with in those days. Do you think that a really nice palace is what makes you a king? And then he adds this. Didn't your father have food and drink? Jeremiah speaks to the king and says, He defended the cause of the poor and needy, and so all went well. Isn't that not that what it means to know me, the Lord? And the prophecy and the message moves almost to a taunt. Do you think that having a nice palace are going to make your person great? Do you think that your position is what gives you the authority? Don't you think that character integrity are more important than the size of the, or the look of your palace? Notice, your father did not build the palaces by using slaves. And God blessed him. He had food, he had drink, he had all that he needed. And you know what he used his energy for? Instead of building palaces, he defended the cause of the needy and the poor. And this is what it means to know the Lord. This is the message that the prophets bring to the people of God. This is the way how you show that you are God's people. That you are part of the story that started with Exodus. And bringing people out of slavery and oppression. Any kind of oppression. And you are not doing that. The prophets say. And now, when we have looked at that, what it meant to have this prophetic ministry, let's consider the second point. How did people respond? What was the reaction? Now, often you need to know that because these prophets bring and deliver messages from God that are not very comfortable, the kings and the people in power who do not like the words, words of God's prophet surround themselves with their own prophets and religious establishment. They have people, who they also call prophets, who are going to speak to them whatever they want to hear and they like to hear. And so these people just reaffirm what the king wants to hear. And so when we read the text from chapter 22, this is what the prophets are essentially saying to the king, and these are the types of false prophets who are paid to say whatever the king wants to hear. Chapter 26, verses 10 to 11. When the officials of Judah heard about these things, they went up from the royal palace to the house of the Lord and took their place at the entrance of the new gate of the Lord's house. Because in those days where the business is conducted, at the gate. Remember the righteous woman from uh, Proverbs 11? She works from, dusk to, from dawn to dusk the whole day while her husband is doing what? Sitting at the gate. So they are sitting at the gate. And the priests and the prophets said to the officials and all the people, this man should be sentenced to death because he prophesied against this city. You have heard it with your own ears. So what is the response? We don't like what Jeremiah is saying. And it's not that they just ban him from Facebook or Twitter, or they are not going to be, he's not going to be part of the social media. They are going seriously after him. He deserves to die. What is this guy doing? He speaks against our precious city. He uttered the words of condemnation about our institution. 
We cannot allow this guy to keep talking like this. This guy deserves to die. Religion and different ideas are used as a way of oppressing other people. Now, you need to understand this to understand the ministry of prophets and the role of religion in the society. People say, we don't like Jeremiah's message. The system works for us, so don't challenge the system. We are very comfortable, and your message makes us uncomfortable. Our religious thing is working for us, so don't tell us about those that it's not working for. And because we don't like what you say, we not only need to silence you, you need to die. And so now, after we have seen the response, now of course there is much more that we could say, but because of the time, let's go back to uh, Matthew 23, and you are going to understand the words of Jesus. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law, the Pharisees, you hypocrites. You build the tombs for the prophets. You remember the ministry of people like Isaiah and Jeremiah, who all met their death because of faithfully conducting their mandate of a prophet. And you find their grace, maybe even go to Egypt. Can you imagine the expense report? To find the grave of Jeremiah, and then you decorate the graves of the righteous. And then you piously say, if we lived in those days of our ancestors, we would be different. We would not take part with the majority in shedding the blood of the prophets. We would be very different. We would have never responded to Jeremiah like our ancestors. We would have listened. We would have changed. We would have altered our course. We would have returned. We would have repented. We would have reformed. We would have never been that hard to people. And then Jesus adds, so you actually testify against yourself that in reality you are the children, you are the descendants of those parents and forefathers who have murderously treated the prophets. How can Jesus say that? Look at a few chapters back in Matthew 12. Jesus said to his on Sabbath in the synagogue, after they had a discussion about disciples doing something that they considered inappropriate, the self-appointed guardians of morality. In every church you have those who immediately blow the whistle and say, that's not right, we are not supposed to be doing that. And Jesus said to the men, stretch out your hand. And so the men stretched it out, and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. Now, what did Jesus do? He just contradicted a rule that chronic illness can wait, that it's not acute. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Verse 14. And Jesus says to them, do you see what's the problem? You decorate the prophet's tombs and you say, man, we would never have done what our ancestors did. We would never be killing people like Jeremiah. We would have listened. We would have changed. We would not have been so hard-hearted. But the very same people are plotting to kill Jesus. And Jesus says, when you don't deal with this idea in your heart, but we are different. We are better than everybody else. Jesus says there is something in the human fallen nature. If you don't watch out for it, you are going to use your religious status, your religion, as a way of boosting your own morale and saying, oh, but we are special God's people. God loves us more than anyone else. God must be so happy that I am his child. And the moment you start thinking like that, you are on a downward path. 
you are on a dangerous course. Because you stop seeing the connections. You don't realize, actually you are just faithful children of your ancestors. You are not any different. But you don't see it. These people are plotting how to kill Jesus. And Jesus says, you have not changed. You are really children of your parents. You haven't learned a thing. And it got really quiet at the dinner table. You know, Jesus came to start a new community. Jesus wants to gather people who really reflect who God is and what he does. Jesus wants a group of people, a community, where people treat others as they have been treated by God. But the impulse of religious people is that after some years, some decades, or some centuries, if you are talking about the movement, people would say, but we are different. We are better. We would have never done that. And Jesus says, the moment you start thinking like that, if you start entertaining those thoughts, when you start thinking, we are not so thick, so dumb like those people. We are different from them. It damages you more than you realize. You are building your identity on a false foundation. So, in the last step, how does this apply for, to us? To the challenges and issues and the opportunities that we face as we struggle with what it means to be a follower of Jesus in the 21st century? How do we examine ourselves? Jesus says, let me give you a few examples from the Bible and then we will finish. Jesus says in uh, Matthew 13, in the parable, the seed is falling among the thorns. And that, because the disciples are not getting it, so he walks them through the explanation. And he says, this seed refers to someone who hears the word, who becomes a follower of Jesus, who allows that word to do the job. Now remember, he uses the metaphor of the seed because... It's not only for you. When God does something in you, it's in order to bless someone else. So that through you, other people are blessed. And so, you accept it gladly, you hear the word. But then two things. The worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke that word, making it unfruitful. So Jesus is talking here about someone who repents, who becomes a Christian, who invites Jesus into their heart. They join the team. They come down the aisle. They get baptized. They have a profound experience of God's transforming their lives. They are so thrilled. They say, count me in. We are going to change the world. But then something happens. And what is it? The worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, choke the word. And they go back to their boring old life. They start worrying, but what about the inflation? What about this? What about that? The deceitfulness of wealth means they fall under the illusion. If I just get this thing, then I will be able to serve God, then I will have peace and joy. And Jesus says, you just wake up, you go to work, you eat your meal, you watch the TV, you go to sleep, you wake up, and you are caught in a boring, lifeless pattern of living that you don't enjoy, that you don't want. The passion is gone. And what happened to the desire to turn the world upside down? And when you and I read a passage like that, I think that would never happen to me. That's not about me. Jesus says, if you catch yourself thinking like this, maybe you are that type of soil. Maybe you need to examine yourself and see what's going on. Where in me this type of thinking 
these worries of life, the deceitfulness, if I only had this or that, is going to choke my religious experience. Let's go to the second example. They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked his disciples, what were you arguing about on the road? And suddenly they kept very quiet, because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. And the disciples say, oh, did he hear that? He didn't hear that, did he? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. We are busted. What did you argue about? They kept quiet because here they are, followers of Jesus, walking with the one who said the first will be the last and the last will be the first, who said I came to serve, not to be served. They walk with the divine embodiment of compassion and submission, yet they are arguing who is the best, who is the greatest. They are massaging their ego. They are wanting to be noticed, to be adored. They need to cite their accomplishments. And somehow the ambition, which is a beautiful thing, turned selfish and self-destructive. And Jesus says, what were you discussing? Lagging behind me so that I don't hear you? Which one of us gets noticed? Which one of us will be promoted? Which church is the best church? Which religious group is God's true body? Oh, we would never do that. We would never discuss things like that. And Jesus says, every time you start thinking and talking like this, there is something dangerous in your spiritual path. And you are not even aware of it. Let's go to the penultimate example. Luke 10. Jesus said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And when he was attacked by the robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And a priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he said, saw the man, he passed by on the other side. And to a Levite, when he came to the place, he saw him, but he passed him on the other side. Now, I don't know if you have seen the road from Jerusalem to Jericho or from... Let me tell you this, it's not M25, okay? It's not four lanes. It's just a couple feet wide. So passing by means either stepping over or going around. There are no four lanes. And Jesus says, if I saw somebody hurting in my path, and you start thinking, I would not just keep going. I am not a priest. I am not a Levite. If you catch yourself that you are thinking, but I would be different. I would not ignore a genuine need. You are on a dangerous path. Because we all do it. And let me conclude with the one that does not apply to anyone in Binfield or Newbold Church, but because we have this uh, huge international audience, I should mention it. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, this is very interesting because Jesus is a Torah rabbi. His task is to interpret the Torah, God's revelation. But somebody comes to him and says, can you deal with part, this particular legal matter for me and for my family? Because something serious has happened in this family. There is a division of the closed-knit group between two brothers or within a family or in a tribe, in a small village. And because of this division, a significant relationship is in trouble. The relationship is fractured because some inheritance, an inheritance involved possession or involved money. So here we have a case where a relationship is fractured because of money or possession. 
And if there is anything within us that says, oh, I would never let money or possession come between a significant relationship. I would never allow that to happen. Jesus says, you are on a dangerous path. And you are not even aware of that. As we consider the challenges, the issues, and the opportunities of Adventism that we are struggling with in 21st century, we need to return, we need to repent, we need to reform. Because that's the message of Jesus to us. Let us pray. God, we don't want to be the kind of people who say we would never do that because we are. God, we don't want to continue in cycles of complacency and hard-heartedness. We want you to break those cycles. We want to be so soft and open in our hearts that we heed whatever word you are sending to us through whatever means. God, we want to be open to the opportunities that you have for us in our times. We don't want to discount anything that might be use, you might be using to get our attention. We don't want to miss any truth that comes to us through whatever means. We don't want just because the system works for us and because we are comfortable to be isolated and to miss the offer of better life that you extend to each one of us every day. Forgive us for the ways in which our lives have become too complicated, too stressed, too anxious. Forgive us, God, for all the ways in which we have sim missed the simple, compelling call of your kingdom. We repent and we want to chart a new course, but we realize we can do it only with your guidance and in the strength of your Holy Spirit. So come to us because we need your reassurance that you have truly nailed all of our sins to the cross and that even today you are still redeeming us and bringing us to the wholeness and making us a new creation that we all long to be. We pray all this in the strong healing name of Jesus. Amen.